you would, to Exodus chapter 16. We'll be there. We'll be in chapter 17 a bit. As usual, I will skip around in chunks of 16 and 17, not leaving anything out of context, I promise, and would hope that maybe you would go back and read the chapters before, the chapters after, at some time this week, maybe even this day. But chapter 16 and 17 of Exodus is where we'll begin in a moment, and then we'll be in the Gospel of John. Now, let me just set up the context. We were in Exodus last week. We were in Exodus chapter 19 and 20. We went all the way to the foot of Mount Sinai. You remember all of that. We talked about the birth of the nation of Israel and how that connects even today, even today to the Feast of Pentecost among the Orthodox Jews. At the same time, the birth of the church. Israel was born. It was birthed with the giving of the law at Sinai. The church was born with the giving of the Holy Spirit in downtown Jerusalem. Those two connections are amazing. Old Testament to New Testament. Connections, connections. It's all connected. Think about that. Over 40 different authors of 66 books written over a period of 1,500 years by hand. There were no copying machines and printers. There were no computers. It was by hand and then reproduced by hands and distributed around the world. And today we still have it practically exactly as it was written down. The whole world has tried to destroy it over and over and over. Yet here it is. There's no other book on the planet like it. And I've preached messages on that, so I won't belabor that point, except to say that it's because mainly the big the prophecies it contains that were written a thousand years or more before they happened. Several of them were written 2,500 years before they happened. That happened to be about the resurrection of Israel that we're looking at and Satan's hatred of it and rousing up the nations against a resurrected Israel. We're living in the midst of it. And it was recorded there and only there. There's no other religious book in the world where all that was recorded right down to the detail. And not only that it would come back, but what would happen when it came back. But more important even than that were all of the prophecies about the first coming of Jesus Christ. And not only are there powerful, detailed prophecies hidden from those down through the ages that didn't have eyes to see yet right there right there the place of his birth out of Bethlehem the fact that he would be born of a of a of a virgin woman Isaiah chapter 7 a virgin will give birth to a child and they will call him Emmanuel and that means in Hebrew Emmanuel that's a Hebrew word it means God is with us all the way back in the garden, Genesis 3.15, God himself said, from the womb of a woman will come a male child that will crush your kingdom, Satan. I mean, what other book in the world would dare to write these things long before they happen? Three huge crucifixion chapters in the Bible. Isaiah 53, Psalm 22, Zechariah 12 and 13. It goes into the details of the piercing of the hands and the feet. Isaiah 53 even talks about the beating, the whipping, the stripes that are laid upon him. It even talks about being buried with rich man, with a rich man in his death. Well, he was in a rich man's tomb, Joseph of Arimathea. It talks about being pierced with, with uh, the wicked criminals on both sides of him. On and on. That was written 700 years before it happened. Psalm 22, written a thousand years before it happened. David goes into a spirit of prophecy. He's taken there, apparently, to the foot of the cross. And he says, Behold, they pierce my hands and my feet. They gamble for my clothing under my feet. They look at me. My bones look at me and stare. My tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth. I thirst. They cry out, he saved others, let him save himself. What's David seeing? The crucifixion, 1,000 years before it happened. There's no other book in the world like it. 
You're going to see some other things. Most of you will know this, but maybe you've never connected it all together. You'll see a few other things like that this morning. Now, those things I was sharing with you, and those aren't the only ones. I mean, you've got Abraham taking his son Isaac right to the very spot where the temple would be built in a stone's throw from where Jesus would actually be crucified. Abraham, the father of Israel, now is called upon to take his only son and sacrifice him. And at the last second, even though Abraham was being obedient, and so was the son. Boy, I'd like to have heard that conversation. Don't know that mama was real happy about it. But at the last minute, an angel of the Lord substitutes a lamb. And Abraham names that mountain the place where God will provide. Fifteen hundred years before it would happen in that spot. No other book in the world like this, folks. Right down to he will be born in Bethlehem. Right down to his ministry will start along the shores of Galilee. And right down to naming the miracles that he would do. By the way, miracles that no one else in the Old Testament, no prophet in the Old Testament did. But miracles that are outlined in the Old Testament as things that only God can do. How many times have I preached on God is the only one who can walk upon the waters and still the wind and the waves with his hand and with his voice. That's in the Old Testament about seven times. God's the only one that can do it. By the time we land in the New Testament, we have two instances of, God, of Jesus doing that in front of witnesses on Lake Galilee in the midst of horrendous storms, which means everybody that lived on the lake also knew at the time that it stopped. The feeding of the 5,000, nobody has ever been able to just speak. And the elements not only obey the wind and the waves, only God. No one has ever been able to speak and elements begin to, what we would say with our human eyes, create themselves. A few loaves of bread, a few fish. He didn't even really need that. You do understand, right? That's a picture of us, the little boy with the fish. He didn't need the boy. He didn't need the fish, but he allowed the boy and he allowed the fish. He allowed the bread as a symbol to those around of, look, come to me with all you have and I will multiply it and I will bless you and I will use you in my kingdom work for the glory of my name and for your own peace and power and even pleasure. And he passes it out and he feeds five. In other words, that's 5,000 men. In other words, the women and children. So there's over 10,000 people there at least. And that's how many witnesses were there. All last week we went, or excuse me, last week we went all the way back to Exodus chapter 20 at the foot of Mount Sinai. You remember what I told you or what the scriptures say? And I just reminded you there were several million people there. According to the word of God, Exodus 12, let me just remind you, after the Passover event and the blood is shed and put over the doors and they go in, all of that, a picture of the cross and the bloodstained cross and go through the door. Jesus said, I am the door. I am the way. It's all a picture of salvation that's coming in Jesus Christ. But they do that. They then go out into the wilderness. All of that is happening. And that same chapter, Exodus 12 says, over 600 men left. And it says, not counting the women and children. Now, add the women and children to that, you're over a million people. Well over. And then it says, and a mixed multitude, an uncountable multitude of others went out with them. That means other nations. I've shown you all the way back to the Exodus event, God's people, the real ecclesia, if you will, the church, the called out ones. They're Jews and Gentiles. They came out under the blood of the Lamb together, several million people, Jews and Gentiles. The Jews were in charge. They were the priests, if you will. They were the ones God called to bring all this about. But Jews and Gentiles were at the foot of Mount Sinai receiving the commandments from God's own voice. You remember that from last week? They heard it. Exodus 20 says that. Deuteronomy 5 says that. Hebrews says that. Chapter 8. 
So all of these things are connected. And if you'll notice, and if you'll remember, I emphasized it last week, you'll see it again today. But, but all of these things were witnessed. I mean, think about the whole Passover event. Millions of people at the foot of Mount Sinai scared them to death. They admit it. They talked about it. They begged Moses, you go up, tell him, don't speak in our presence. They saw the smoke and the fire and the 10,000 times 10,000 angels that covered the top of the mountain. They heard the trumpets from heaven blowing. They, all of that, they witnessed it. And they were in the wilderness for 40 years together as a people of several million. And once a year, they would stop and have kind of like our Thanksgiving service, Passover. They would celebrate what God had done by bringing them out of slavery into a new land for 40 years. Don't you know, you know, there are detractors of the word of God. That would have us say, well, all that was fake. Uh, you know, they just made all that up. Don't you know? <laughs> For 40 years, people would not be celebrating a fake thing that they had witnessed. And don't you know that 40 years would cover about three generations of people at various ages? Let me explain what I mean. I'm just going to round it off. I, this is my 37th year. Here's your pastor. Let me just use the word 40, okay? So 40 years together as pastor and people. When I came here 37 to 40 years ago, I held babies that were being born within my first few weeks, months, whatever, first year or two. Those babies have now grown up. I did their weddings, and I was there when their babies were born in the 37, 40 years. Three generations you see how that works? That's how long they were in the wilderness. All of those generations, either the first generation that was there, some of the second generation might have already been there as little ones. The third generation would come along and the second and the first generation assured them we were there. Oh, we all saw it. We all heard it. It terrified us all. Think about it. The second and third generations, especially the little ones of the second generation, and then the third generation that were growing up in those 40 years, they didn't know anything about Egypt other than what their history told them. The little ones that came out probably had no memory of it as time went on, as they became adults. It's a pretty traumatic event. Maybe they did have some memory of it, but not the details. And that celebration, listen to me now, has never stopped since then. It is now the world's oldest continual ritual, and the world would say religious ritual, of any religion on the planet. Passover. Jews and Christians, billions and billions and billions of Christians celebrate it through the Lord's Supper. Jews around the world celebrate it. And it goes all the way back to Egypt and Pharaoh and that night of Passover. And standing at the foot of Sinai, millions of witnesses to it all, all down through history. And for all these thousands of years, continually celebrating it. You get into the New Testament, nothing Jesus did was in secret. I mean, in some cases, there might have just been two or three people there, but there were also instrumental people connected to it that knew that it happened and saw it. But most of, and then they would tell it, but most of the time, there were thousands. <laughs> I mean, even if it was a synagogue service, there might be a hundred people there, or sometimes a little less, sometimes more, depending upon the size of the city they were in. Jesus healed a man's withered hand right in the middle of a synagogue service. It went down in history. They wrote about it. He cast demons out all day long in the crowds that had come from the surrounding nations and the surrounding areas of the Roman Empire. The Bible records that. And then, as I said, all of these things, the, heel, the, the, the stopping of the wind and the waves while they're out on the sea, they had just been with 10,000 people that saw the disciples get in the boats, go out there without Jesus. Jesus goes up into the mountains. During the night, the storm rages. And, of course, we know Jesus got there. 
in the midst of the storm. How many of you know if Jesus sends you out in a storm, he will come and be with you? If we are obedient, if we are faithful, where he has asked us to be. And don't you know, all along those lake shores, when that hurricane force storm stopped instantly, and then that boat comes back to Capernaum shores the next day, and Jesus is in the boat. Wait, he didn't. He was in the. He didn't leave. With how? There was a storm. What? How? The disciples said, "Y'all sit down. We got a story to tell you guys." And then, within a decade or so. The gospel started being written. Now, there's four of them that were written within the first generation of all of that that happened. And there's so much more. And I'm just refreshing a little bit and telling you some new stuff, but just reminding you as we get ready to get back all the way back in Exodus, even before Sinai. Now, I'm going to go back before they arrived at Sinai. They had been in the wilderness escaped from Egypt, if you will, under the blood of the Lamb and had been backed up to the Red Sea. God opened it. They went through. Pharaoh's army pretty much obliterated. Another picture of the last days, the nations that will come against Israel and will be obliterated. It's all, it's all connected, guys. And so now we're going to pick up at a time where they have been in the wilderness for one month. As a matter of fact, one month to the day that they left when this is what we're going to read is told. By the time we wind up at the foot of Mount Sinai, you'll remember it says three months to the day they left, they arrived in the area of Sinai, millions of them, and they camped at the foot of the mountain. Remember all that from last week? Even after all that turkey and dressing, you remember that? <laughs> all those Thanksgiving comas on the couch? <laughs> That's why I love y'all. Y'all remember everything I say. <laughs> if I could get my wife to do that. Was... Did I say that out loud? I thought I was just... <laughs> okay, uh, nobody heard that. Except the whole world. We're going to pick up in Deuteronomy 16. They're on their way to Sinai. I, I'm sorry, Exodus 16. I don't know why I said Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 16, I preached on that. I love that passage too. I better, better keep my mind straight. Well, there's a squirrel. There's another squirrel. I need to keep my mind right. I'll be all over Deuteronomy 16 now. <laughs> I preached that here a few months ago. I love preaching that. Anyway, Exodus 16. <clears throat> First one. We're going to skip around, so follow with me. But nothing is taken out of context. I'm just doing this for the matter of, matter of time, of course. The whole Israelite community, they set out from Elim, and they came to the desert of Sin, which is between Elim and Sinai. On the 15th day of the second month, I, I said first, I think, when my introduction is, the second month after they had come out of Egypt. Remember, they came out on the 15th day of Nisan. The 14th day was when they slaughtered the lamb. The lamb. And then that evening at sunset, which would have been in the Jewish time of reckoning, the next day, it started then. The 15th day. So here we are exactly two months from the Passover event after they had come out of Egypt. Verse 2. In the desert, the whole community then, they're two months out, grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The Israelites said to them, if only, y'all look at me for a moment. If I was going to give this message a title, that'd be it <laughs> right there. If only. If only, Lord, if I only had this or if I only had that. Look what they have. If I only had that. If I only could go here. If I could only do this. If I only, if, if only, if only this was different in my life. If only that was, if, if only, if only, if only. And sometimes, you know, that's why Jesus said, sometimes you have not because you don't even ask. If only. 
if only you would ask. Were you supposed to just give it to me? You're not a robot. You're not a puppet. You're not an animal. You're made in my likeness. I'm your father. You're my daughter, my son. Relationship with me. Ask me. Love me like I love you. You'd be surprised at what I do for you. If only they came to Moses and Aaron. They're two months out. If only we had died. That's what, see, if I was Moses, I said, wish granted. <laughs> if I was God, I would have said, what the, what they say? Michael, Gabriel, come here. Whoa. If only we had died back in Egypt. Because there we sat around pots of meat and ate all the food we wanted. But you've brought us out here into this desert to starve the entire assembly to death. Sounds like a Baptist church. <laughs> I, I didn't say us. I said a Baptist church. <laughs> If only, if on two months out, how quickly they forget the Passover. How quickly they forget the 10 plagues that went on for a year and a half that caused Pharaoh basically to fold his hands and, I mean, and to fold before God. And, and, and then the Passover event and then, and then the up, against, up against the Red Sea in the parting of the water, something they had never seen before. And on and on, the sustenance that you, you're going to see more that's going to happen here. But, but I mean, here they are two months out and they've already forgotten the gratitude that they had before. This is kind of a good post-Thanksgiving service, isn't it? You, you know, I know that we, we know, but we all, we, you hear the word we, it's me too. We all have to guard against taking the blessings of God for granted, don't we? I mean, I mean, we've been, we are blessed people for generations. Our generations have grown up in strength and relative peace. And if we don't have peace, we can get it pretty quickly because God has blessed us so much. In relative wealth, and I don't mean everybody's wealthy, but I mean almost everybody can eat and does eat and if they can't. There are people that will feed them. I mean, we're just blessed. Most of the world doesn't live like we live. And so, as a nation, we take one day, and that's, that's cool, take one day, and the first proclamations of Thanksgiving from Washington and then Lincoln and some other presidents, then Congress, all of them included thanking God, thanking God, either divine providence, which means the, div the, the divinity, the heavenly providence, which means power, the omnipotent power, the all-powerful one, divine present, uh, providence, or thanking God Almighty. Those were in the declarations, Thanksgiving declarations. We just came th through Thanksgiving. The leadership of our nation now didn't mention God at all. Not even divine providence. By the way, the guy he worked for back in 2016 didn't do, do it either. You think there's an agenda here? Yeah, but from our founding, we've taken a day as a nation and said, we must thank Almighty God for what we have, for the freedom we have and the opportunities we have. Here are the Israelites, similar situation, two months after Thanksgiving, and they're talking about we need to go back. We had meat in our pots been better if we just died right there. What that means is, is that they live out their lives and then die there, not in this wilderness. Really. If only, if only, if only. Verse 4. Then the Lord, and when you see capital L-O-R-D, that means Yahweh, that's his name. Then Yahweh said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven. I will do it for you. Here are my instructions. The people are to go out each day and gather enough for that day. In this way, I will test them and see whether they will follow 
my instructions. On the sixth day, they are to prepare what they bring in, and that is to be twice as much as they gather on the other days. So Moses and Aaron said to all the Israelites in the evening, you will know that it was the Lord who brought you out of Egypt. In other words, I, he's probably saying, do we have to remind you of this? Were you not there at the Red Sea? Were you not there during the plagues poured out? But he says, but in the evening, it was the Lord who brought you out of Egypt. We want to remind you of this. And in the morning, you will see the glory of the Lord because he's heard your grumbling against him. Who are we that, we should, that, that, that you should grumble against us? Moses also said, you will know that it was the Lord when he gives you meat to eat in the evening and all the bread you want in the morning because he has heard your grumbling against him. Who are we? He's talking about Moses and Aaron. He said, who are we? He said, you're not grumbling against us. You're grumbling against the Lord. Look at verse 13. Let's move along. That very evening... Quail came and covered the camp. And in the morning, there was what looked like a layer of dew around the camp. When the dew was gone, thin flakes like frost on the ground appeared on the desert floor. When the Israelites saw it, they said to each other, what is this? For they had never seen it before, anything like it. Moses said to them, it is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. Go to verse 31. The people of Israel called the bread manna. It's a Hebrew word. You can find out what it means. It was white like coriander seed and tasted like wafers made with honey. Moses said, this is what the Lord has commanded. Take an omer of manna and keep it for the generations to come so that they can see that's several courts so they can see the bread I gave you to eat this is what the Lord said to Moses so that they can see the generations see the bread that I gave you to eat in the desert when I brought you out of Egypt so Moses said to Aaron take a jar put an, o an omer of manna in it then place it before the Lord to be kept for the generations to come as the Lord can, that eventually wound up in the ark of the covenant as the Lord commanded Moses Aaron put the manna in front of the testimony that would be the holy of holies the holy word place of the tabernacle in the wilderness that it might be kept the Israelites ate manna 40 years how long did they eat it how many people ate it? Millions. The Israelites ate manna for 40 years until they came to a land that was settled. They ate manna until they reached the border of Canaan. That's when they crossed over the Jordan River. And when you get into the book of Joshua, you discovered the day they crossed over, get this, was 40 years to the day that they left. It was on Passover. Look at chapter 17. <clears throat> Verse 1. The whole Israelite community set out then from the desert of Sin, traveling from place to place as the Lord commanded. That is in, in, the, in the wilderness area, which was huge. Spanned a huge section of the Middle East over there. They camped at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. So they quarreled with Moses and said, give us some water to drink. <laughs> Moses replied, why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to a test? But the people were thirsty for water there, and so they grumbled against Moses, and they said, Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to make us and our children and our livestock die of thirst? It only took a few weeks, and they were ungrateful again. Man, we got to work hard against this, guys. Verse 4, Then Moses cried out to the Lord, What am I to do with these people? They're almost ready to stone me. And thus saith the Lord, Kill them all. No, that, that would have been me if I was, and I'm not, so, you know, okay. But the Lord answered Moses, 
Walk on ahead of the people. Take with you some of the elders of Israel and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile and go. That staff represented God's power and his presence. And so that the staff wasn't magic or anything, just it was a, an object lesson. He had it with him. Strike the rock and, the, and water will come out of it for the people to drink. <laughs> he says, uh, I will stand there before you by the rock at Horeb, which is right next to Sinai. Strike the rock and water will come out of it for the people to drink. So Moses did this in the sight of all the elders of Israel. More witnesses. And he called the place Massah and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and because they tested the Lord saying, is the Lord still among us or not? Massah means to quarrel. Meribah means to test. And so they get there, and you keep reading, and you find out there were springs of water. Springs and the water coming out of the rock. What's the hymn we sing? Rock of ages, cleft for me, open up. Let me hide myself in thee. So God was providing springs of living water and bread from heaven. He had sent them for a purpose. And even though some of them grumbled along the way, I'm sure many didn't, but many did, God still provided them, provided for them, sustained them, took care of them. Look at the next verse of chapter 17, verse 8. Now the Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. Y'all look at me. I've already preached on this. From Genesis 28, we find out who the Amalekites are. That was Isaac's son, Esau. He had a brother, Jacob, remember? Esau sold his birthright. Then he wanted it back, couldn't get it, was mad, rebelled. His daddy, Isaac, gave the blessing to Jacob. It's all, it's, it's all back in Genesis. Then we find out in Genesis 28 that he is filled with rage. And to get daddy back and to get Jacob back, he goes off to the house of Ishmael, the illegitimate son who had already become enemies of God's people, and he marries Ishmael's daughter. You remember that? He later on has a grandson named Amalek. His tribe and his clan grew huge. So that whole group of people, and plus Esau married several other Canaanite women, Hittites, the Bible says, and so that whole group of people became known as the Amalekites from Amalek, the grandson of Esau. Is everybody with me? Then from there came a huge tribe of descendants from a guy named Agag who became a king who was among them. And those became known as the Agagites, and these all were from the Amalekites. Now, I'm not trying to confuse you here, but remember, and I've already preached on this, but i got to hit this before we go to the New Testament. All the way through the Word of God, we hear about the Amalekites or the, or the Agagites, and then we get to the children of Israel in the land. Then we get eventually to the King David and King Solomon, and then a civil war, and then the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, and then the Assyrian Empire comes down down and takes this northern kingdom off into captivity and then eventually the Babylonian empire rises King Nebuchadnezzar they come in they breach the walls they tear the temple down they take the rest of Israel into captivity and now there is no more Israel at all you remember all of that and then eventually the Persians rise the Persians that's modern day Iran I've told you this before, and most of you know it. On the maps and globes of the world, until 1935, that whole area of the world was called Persia in school books and on globes. You could look it up on your cell phone back then. <laughs> See? Took you a minute, didn't it? Because you think we've always had cell phones. <laughs> See? <laughs> but it's Iran. They were eventually then in control of the world. Iran. That's where a man named Haman, who was an Agagite, remember that? It says it in the book of Esther. 
he issued a decree with the, he was the king's right hand man. And his decree was kill all the Jews. Who was it that said that? It was, let's use our modern word. It was Iran in the ancient days. You see how it all connects? It's not just some old dead history book of that Jewish literature stuff. I mean, all along from the beginning, millions and millions and millions of people, the entire Egyptian empire, the pharaohs, they witnessed it. The millions that left witnessed it, Jews and Gentiles. They witnessed the manna. They witnessed the quail. They witnessed the rock and the water. They witnessed Mount Sinai. They witnessed it, all, millions of them. And for 40 years, and their children, and their children's children, and their children's children, they all grew up under all of that. They stepped over into the promised land on that day of Passover from 40 years before, on the very day, it says in the book of Joshua. This is, this is stuff, to this day they celebrate it. To this day, the church under Jesus Christ, we celebrate it as the Lord's Supper. There's no other religion in the world. We don't have a religion here. We've got a relationship with our creator through Jesus Christ. Amen. But I'm just using that term because the world understands that. No other religion in the world has any tradition or service that or ritual that has lasted from its beginning up to this very day none it's all connected to the garden of eden right up to our day bread in the wilderness water from a rock go to john chapter six we'll pull some things together here in a minute hang on John chapter 6. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Chapter 6 is easy to find. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. <laughs> well, I mean, yeah, it's just a few days after Thanksgiving. Might not be so easy. John chapter 6. Let me set it up. Most of you know this very well, but let me just set it up again for the context right here and now. So Jesus' ministry has basically, it's in the newer days of it, in the first year probably or so. His headquarters is Capernaum, a, a town, large town on Lake Galilee. That's their headquarters. That's where he chooses his first disciples, or most of them anyway. That's where, in the area of where he preached the Sermon on the Mount, his first recorded sermon. Surely he spoke others, but that one was recorded. That's where he fed the 5,000. That's where he got his disciples Put, told them to get in the boat and go to the other side. I'll meet you over there. I'm going up in the mountains to pray because these people are trying. They were trying to take him as a king because they saw, I mean, 10,000 people. They got their bellies fed and they knew it was from two loaves of bread and two fish. They watched the whole thing. The next thing you know, they got baskets overflowing with leftovers. All he did was speak, let there be, and there was. Who can do that? Only God. Who can open the eyes of people born blind? Only God. Who can walk upon the waves? Who can speak to the wind and command the elements of the earth? Only God. And he's doing all of these things. Who can raise the dead? Only God. Who can speak to a gaggle of lepers and say, you're now clean. Go show yourself to the priests. With a word, you're clean. Only God. Here he is in the flesh. He sends his disciples to the other side. They say, well, if we go across, how are you going to? He could have walked around. That would have taken several days. And sometimes he would go off alone for a while. And so they probably, but they probably asked him, well, how are you going to get there? And he probably just winked and said, don't you worry about me. I'll be there before you know it and right when you need me, right on time. 
I'll be there. You just go where I tell you to go, do what I tell you to do, and do it with thankfulness and faith, and I will provide. So they go, and it was in the middle of that journey. The Bible says they were about three and a half miles out, and when you're rowing with paddles, a boat full of men, three and a half miles is a long way out. And that's when this hurricane-style storm that does come to Lake Galilee between those mountain ranges on both sides of that huge lake, when it ripped down through there in the middle of the night. These guys were seasoned fishermen, yet they were screaming and crying for their lives. They thought, this is it. And the miracle worker rabbi that we're following is nowhere around. Oh, nowhere and here he comes, walking on the waters. Wait, wait, wait. Six times in the Old Testament it says, only God can walk upon the waters and not even leave a footprint. Only God can speak to the elements, the wind and the waves, and they obey him. And here he comes. Well, they get back, they get back to shore, and I'm, I've already preached this before, but right here in, in, in John 6, and you can read it, listen to me, L-A-T-E-R, later, okay? Y'all look at me, because we're going to get, I see everybody's down there going, I got to read ahead, I got, this is good. Yeah, the Bible's good, that's what we try to tell you every Sunday, it's good, read it. So watch. The Bible says right there that when they sh came back to shore, that next morning, the people came running down to the shore. They knew those disciples had set out. Most of them had their bellies fed. They, 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 they go down there and they say, how, how, did this, how did this happen? You weren't in the boat. How did you get in? There was a storm. There was a hurricane. How did? And, and, and I'm just saying this. I'm sure the disciples said, hey, y'all sit down. We got a story to tell you. But eventually it was told. It was written down. But of course they told them, of course. But what happens next is Jesus begins speaking to them. And first he gets on to them a little bit. He said, the only reason that you're crowding around, because before long they were, they were all around him, like do another miracle, work another magic trick, do something for me, you know. And he said, you know, the only reason that you're here like this ganging around me is because you want your bellies fed again. He was saying, you're awfully ungrateful and you don't have eyes to see. You sit in synagogue all the time and you hear the scriptures read about only God can speak and create. Only God can walk upon the waters and calm a storm with his voice. All of that has happened to you in the last week or so. And yet you still don't see. So he gets on to them. Sweetly, of course, but he does. And he tells them. And then he says, I filled your bellies with bread. And that's why you're here. Look at verse 52. Because what he's, well, go, go to 47. 47 of chapter 6. Jesus says, I tell you the truth. He who believes, and what he means is, is, in me, because he's already said that earlier, has everlasting life. Wait a minute. Who, who's the only one that can give you everlasting life? Okay. Look at next, look, verse 48. I am the bread of life. Wait, who's the only one who is the bread of life? God. Verse 49. Your forefathers ate the manna in the desert. Yet they died. That is, means they went on to live out their life, and then they died a physical death. In other words, that bread that was coming down was to sustain them in the desert, but there was nothing supernatural about it other than its appearance and that you asked for food, and it came from the heavens. But he said they ate of that bread, and they died. How long did they do that? Forty years. How many people saw it? Millions and millions and millions. Are you all with me? Verse 50. But here, and he's pointing to, his, to himself, here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which a man may eat and not die. <clears throat> I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, and again, he's pointing to himself, he will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. 
There's a declaration of what he's there for. Then the Jews began to argue sharply among themselves. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth, unless you eat my flesh and uh, the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Now remember, that sounds weird if you just take that verse right out of context by itself, doesn't it? I mean, we got to be accountable to follow you. No, the whole context. It's all about Passover. It's all about the bread. It's all about the water. It's all about the fruit of the vine. It's all about salvation. It's all about the Lord's Supper later. It's about the crucifixion. It's about the resurrection. But they are, don't have the eyes to see that yet. So he's, he says that. So they begin to argue sharply among themselves. And he says, he says, verse, verse uh, 54, so whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life and I will raise him up at the last day. Wow. So he's the bread. He's the blood. He's the sacrifice. He's the one that can raise us from the dead. He's the one that can give us eternal life. What is he claiming here? How many, how, how many times do you hear people say, well, Jesus never claimed to be God. Y'all just make that up. Well, just wait. I got another surprise for you. <laughs> for my flesh is real food and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your forefathers ate manna and died, but he who feeds on this bread will live forever. He said this. While teaching in the synagogue at Capernaum, he wasn't on the beach. He had a captive audience. They went berserk. There were even some in the synagogue, Jews who were trying to believe, wanted to believe, thought they were going to believe. And the Bible says they left. So many of those left. And so Jesus turns right there in the area of the synagogue after the services are over. Don't you, wouldn't you have loved to have been in that place after the services were over? Bet there wasn't much fellowship going on among the aisles. Jesus turns to the 12 and he says, I, he said, you going to leave me too? Now, I know he was serious about that, but I also kind of have in my mind's eye, and I could be wrong, he might have winked and smiled a little bit. You guys going to leave me too? <laughs> After all you've seen, you, you remember a couple nights ago when I walked on water to you? And so you're going to leave me because I say this, which by the way is true? You're going to leave me too? And of course, they didn't. And they said that they would follow him. That's chapter 6. Go to chapter 7 of John. All right, here's what happens. Between that synagogue preaching we heard <laughs> in chapter 7, we're now moving into the last three or four months of Jesus' life. He's on his way to the cross, and it's the Feast of Tabernacles and People in that area were asking him, aren't you going up to the feast? Because people were already on the road headed that way. He had to walk to Jerusalem, a good three days walk, unless you had a, you know, a cart or some beast of burden. And most of the people didn't. They just put their foot in the road. It took them three days. Jesus wasn't making any preparations, and his disciples with him were not doing it. And people asked him, aren't you guys going up? Aren't you going up? He said, no, it's not my time yet. But then we pick up at chapter 7 and we find out that Jesus right in the middle of that feast of tabernacles which was an, a seven day feast with another day added to it as a special day I've preached on that I don't want to get lost in the weeds here well let's just say it's an eight day feast and the last day was called the last and greatest day of the feast by the way that's when Hamas attacked Israel this year on the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles. And I just preached on that and told you why and the symbolism, <clears throat> excuse me, the symbolism of all of that and what that meant and why they did it. It's Satan. He hates Israel. He hates the Jewish people. He hates Jesus Christ. He hates those who follow Jesus Christ. And this was the punctuation mark of it all because on that day, the last and the greatest day of the feast. Look at verse 37 of chapter 7. 
On that last and greatest day of the feast, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. By this, he meant the Holy Spirit, whom those who received, believed in him were to re later receive. Up to that time, the Spirit of God had not come upon them. Verse 46, on hearing his words, some of the people said, surely this man is the prophet. They were expecting a prophet before the Messiah. Others said, no, he's the Messiah. Well, still others said, how can the Christ come from Galilee? Does not the scripture say the Christ will come from David's family and from Bethlehem? Actually, scripture says both. If they had known the scriptures, they would have known that. The town where David lived, thus the people were divided because of Jesus. In the same way, y'all look at me. The world's divided because of Jesus to this day. Sadly, some of our families are. Some of our friendships are. Some of us have lost job opportunities or promotion opportunities because of our faith in Jesus. Satan's always at work in the midst of all of that. You know what happens next? Just follow me. In John chapter 8, the next day, that's when the Pharisees brought the woman caught in adultery. You remember that? I've preached deeply into this. That's when Jesus knelt and started writing in the dirt. You remember that? You remember, I took you and showed you what it was he was writing. You say, Carl, how can you do that? Nobody knows that. Nobody knows where in the scriptures is. Yes, it does. All the way back in Jeremiah 17, verse 13, where God is speaking to Israel who have gone into captivity in Babylon because they have rejected him. They've served pagan idols. They've gotten involved in all manner of filth under several different kings. And finally, God took his hand off of them. And the enemies came in and took them off into captivity. And God said to the leaders among those people, he said, I have written your name in the dust of the earth with my finger. And I've done this because you have rejected the living water of life. What do you think Jesus is doing? What has he just declared? I am the living water of life. And the people rejected him. Then they bring this woman called an adultery. What does he do? He puts Jeremiah 17, 13 right in front of their faces. And in the Greek where it says he wrote in the dirt, the name, the word there in Greek means he cataloged something. In other words, Jeremiah 17, 13 says, I've written your names there. But then he starts cataloging. And from the oldest to the youngest, they looked down at what he was writing. They dropped their stones and they left. More than likely, since he's God. And it says he, and, and back in Jeremiah 17, 13, it says, I, the Lord, know your thoughts. I know your lives. So what do you think he's cataloging? Their lives, their thoughts. They brought this woman caught in adultery while some of their minds are filled with adultery. Some of them might have already been involved in adultery and they thought no one knew until Jesus wrote the details in the dirt at their feet. That's why they dropped their rocks and left. Over and over and over, he's showing the world who have eyes to see that they're looking into the face of their creator. Only he can bring bread from heaven. Only he can bring water from a rock. Only he can bring streams of living water. Only he can speak to the wind and the waves and stop it. Only he can take a few elements and didn't even need those, but wanted that little boy to know that he was valuable in the kingdom. And he spoke and created enough to feed the bellies of tens of thousands of people. Only he can raise the dead. Only he can give life. Only he but what does the world say? And what do a lot, sadly, of people who call themselves Christians, and I am not judging someone's salvation. I'm just saying people say, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian. But if only, if only I had what he had, I had what she had. I, if, if only God would just do this, if only God would do that, if only, if only, if only, if only. We're right on the other side of Thanksgiving as a nation. Our leaders didn't even give God a mention.
We are God's people. Not only do we give him more than a mention, but we worship him. And we will speak the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah, without shame. We are not ashamed of the gospel. We are not ashamed of the word of God. We're not ashamed to be a part of the body of Christ. We are not ashamed to say Israel in the Middle East is a prophecy of God 50 times in the Old Testament. From Deuteronomy to Zechariah, he says, in the last days, I'm bringing Israel back. Now it's there, and the whole world rejects it. Almost, you know, not everybody in the world, but I mean, it seems like the whole world and nations come against it to destroy it. Just what the Bible had already said 2,500 years ago. I mean, we are living inside the living word right now. The living word is living all around us. We're just in a different age and technology is different, but, but we're the first generation to see the return of Israel. We're the first generation to see Iran come from the dust of the earth again and gather the nations around it and attack through Hamas and Hezbollah and breathe out threats and connecting itself to Russia and China and Turkey. We're the first generation to watch these things happening. We don't set dates in this church and I don't know what's going to happen next as far as some timeline and I'm not going to make a PowerPoint and put a dot and say, this is, this is going to happen here and this is going to happen here and here's what's going to happen there. I just know what God's word says and I know what's happening in the world around me and I know it's all connected and it goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden and it goes all the way up to the time that we're living in and a lot of people, billions on the planet, don't see the connection at all. And it's right before their eyes, just like God in the flesh, the only one that could calm the wind and the waves, the only one that could create elements by speaking, the only one that could heal by speaking, the only one that could raise the dead right in front of their face. And because they were so wrapped up in the world around them and jealousy and pride and envy and wealth, and he was messing some of that up, kill him. You see how blind the world is? Paul wrote to the church at Thessalonica, the first book, Thessalonians 1, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And he said, listen, that day is coming, that great day of the Lord, when the Lord Jesus will return and Satan will be defeated and all the powers of the earth will be crushed. He said, that day is coming and you know full well it will come like a thief in the night. Then he goes on to say, but that day will not catch you like a thief in the night. In other words, if we have eyes to see, we will see. And we will know. We may not know the day or the hour or the minute or the second or even the year or even the decade but we can see what's unfolding before us unless we want to say, I don't want to see it. I just want to immerse myself in the world because I got to get this and I got to get that. And I want, and if only I had this and you see how it ties all the way back, even among God's people that were coming out of slavery, out of Egypt, human nature, fallen human nature. We're living in Satan's world. That's why the apostle Paul, that same apostle Paul said, this day will not take you like a thief in the night. But that's why he wrote in Ephesians 6, he says, now remember our battle, what you see happening in the world in flesh and blood and powers and principalities, kings and kingdoms and presidents and queens and prime ministers. You see all that and you see wars and battles and rumors of wars and kingdoms against kingdoms and nations against nations. But what Paul says, remember, our battle is really not against that flesh and blood. Our battle is against the powers and principalities in the unseen realms, the powers of wickedness and darkness. I mean, remember that. Yeah, sometimes we got to go to war flesh to flesh. Sometimes we got to guard our flesh. And, and, and our mind goes to war against our flesh. All, all of that. Paul didn't mean that, we're, you know, that flesh meant nothing. He was just saying, please remember you're in Satan's world. It is still his kingdom. But it has been defeated at the cross and the resurrection. So you are in Satan's world. Watch this. But not for long. But not for long. 
not for long. So how do we live? Right now we're in the wilderness. <laughs> but we've been sent with a mission. We've been sent with a purpose. The children of Israel were sent with a mission and sent with a purpose. They were sent into the wilderness for 40 years, generation after generation after generation. Millions of them witnessed everything God did so they could tell the story because it was all pointing to Jesus Christ. And it was all pointed, pointing to the eventual return of Israel. Remember, I told you that Moses in the book of Deuteronomy, before they ever set foot in the promised land, he prophesied about the last days and that how in between those times, Israel, that they weren't even Israel yet, but would go into captivity, but in the last days would return and would be gathered from all the nations. That's in Deuteronomy. I mean, it's all tied together. The only reason people don't know it is because they don't know it. <laughs> they won't read it. Preachers don't preach it. So a lot do, but a bunch of them don't. They don't preach it. Christians don't read their Bibles. A lot do, but a bunch of them don't. And we're more concerned about what we can get out of this world then we are what we can do for the glory of God's kingdom that's on its way. If only I had this. If only I could do that. If only somebody would pay attention to me. If only, if only, if only, if only. Usually it's all about the world and all about us. The bottom line is this. Ours is to be faithful where we are in this wilderness journey with our lives. And if... If we are looking to him for our sustenance by faith, and if we are looking to Yeshua HaMashiach for our protection by faith, and if we are looking to Yeshua HaMashiach for the power to continue our mission and to be faithful where we are, he will give it. We saw the bread from heaven. We saw the water from the rock. We saw the defeat of the Amalekites that came right after them. The first nation is going to kill all the Jews related in the future all the way to Haman and the Agagites and Persia and to all the way in the future from there to today, the headline news. It's all connected. Well, who are we? We're the Jews and the Gentiles, most of us Gentiles here probably, but Jews and Gentiles all over the world who are believers in Yeshua HaMashiach, who are still in the wilderness. Watch this, but not for long. So we walk by faith. We remain faithful where we are and listen. And we cover each day with thanksgiving. Give the Lord a hand. We cover each day with thanksgiving. Each day. Every day. Thank you, Jesus. We thank you. If you're here today without ever having surrendered your life to the call of Jesus Christ upon your life, I pray that before this day is over with that you would. Please don't take this for granted. I've stood up here before and preached, shown PowerPoints and preached messages like this. You know, Satan's all up in my head thinking, why'd you even do that? Nobody's listening. I come down here and somebody will come down and say, I gave my life to Jesus today. I'm telling you, it happens. And so I'm saying, if you're one of those here today, we will not single you out. We will not manipulate you. You don't have to worry about a thing. This, we're not going to do anything stupid or crazy. This is not a circus here. You've heard the word. You understand the connection of the word to the day we're living in. We went all the way back to Exodus, actually to Genesis chapter 3. It's time to come to Jesus. The Word of God says it like this, today, if you hear his voice, do not turn from it. Do not turn from it, for today is the day of your salvation. You say, well, how do I do that? Romans 10, 9 says it the most succinctly. If you would confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, then you shall be saved. 
that can begin today. Your journey in the wilderness, we're in the wilderness. It doesn't mean we won't be attacked. It doesn't mean that sometimes we wonder where our next loaf of bread and our next glass of water is coming from. But it does mean God says, you're doing what I'm telling you to do. You're going where I'm telling you to go. You're, you're on the mission I've sent you on. I will go to the other side of the lake. I don't care how big the storm is. I can calm it. I can bring bread from heaven. I can split a rock wide open and give you water. I can heal your hurts. I can heal your body. I can do whatever I need to do if you are being faithful where you are in me. That is why we're here. We are the Noahs of our day. We are the Lots of our day. We are the Esters of our day, of the Persian Empire that stopped the Jews from getting slaughtered, risked her life. We are those people, the days of Noah, the days of Lot, the days of Esther. They're here again, guys. And that's who we are, if you want to be, if you will be. But don't ever let those words come out of your mouth. If only. <laughs> no. Be faithful where you are. His hand is upon you. He will take you to the end. He'll meet you on the other side. Faithfully. Pray with me. Ladies and gentlemen, prepare yourself for a brand new book from critically acclaimed best-selling author, Pastor Carl Gallup's The Yeshua Protocol, an explosion of divine revelation for our unique generation. Carl Gallup's takes you on a whirlwind tour through the scripture like you've never experienced. Discover the undeniable Yeshua codes buried within the pages of the Old Testament. Learn the inescapable reality that every living cell in creation is encoded with the very name of God. And be shocked when you see what has been secretly lying within the pages of the Bible that allows you to see Yeshua as you've never before fathomed him. Yeshua Protocol mentions a wide variety of topics such as quantum physics, ancient Hebrew letter meanings, the latest archaeological finds, and Yahweh's name encoded upon our very own DNA. Do you really cover all of these topics in the book, The Yeshua Code? All of those and many more. Yeah, I mean, we're living in incredible times. And, and you know, you speak of, for example, internet technology and all that that entails. You know, I describe it as we are looking at the tree of the knowledge of good and evil.